The great outdoors pose many threats. There's wild animals, crazy people, and even Sasquatch flying in on a paraglider with a machine gun and a Glock 9 ready to blow your ass away. Welcome back to the swamp my friends and welcome if you're new. Today we're going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true outdoors horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. Per usual, if you have a story you would like to share, be sure to submit them at swampdweller.net or on reddit at r slash thedarkswamp. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Today's episode is sponsored by ShipStation. Now, as a small business owner myself, I can tell you that in a landscape where free and fast shipping is the norm, it can be hard for a smaller business like myself to compete and keep up with things like Amazon and all the other massive e-commerce companies that run the internet. But you can keep yourself competitive with ShipStation. When you use ShipStation, you can lower shipping costs, make returns easy, and keep your customers happy. And with all the time you're going to save from automating your shipping task and getting the best deals while doing so, you can keep your business growing all year long. Now personally, something that always stresses me out is making sure packages are shipped out on time and going to the correct destination. ShipStation makes that all effortless. They integrate everything you sell online, including Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify, etc. Etc., and they manage every order from one simple dashboard. You can automate routine shipping tasks, print shipping labels, easily compare rates and delivery times to optimize every shipment, and automate delivery notifications. With the best discounts in the industry, you'll never have to worry about overpaying for shipping ever again. You can get up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates, and if that's not enough, use my promo code to try ShipStation for free for two months. So, what are you waiting for? Join me and many others in the swamp today, use promo code SWAMPED today at ShipStation.com to sign up for your free 60-day trial. Again, that's ShipStation.com, promo code SWAMPED. Stalked in an Ohio State Park by Queasy Comfort I work as a childcare professional, and one of the kids recently got into hiking. So I took him to an excellent Salt Fork State Park trail that I like. We were all set to hike to Hosack's Cave after parking near the trailhead's beginning. The entire course is about a half mile long, so I chose this trail for our daily hike. I also decided this trail because any time I had been on it before, it was hectic and full of people and a trendy spot which made me feel a bit more secure. However, this past summer we had a cluster of severe summer storms that caused massive damage to the trail, so to my surprise it was much more complex and empty. However, I wasn't bothered by the open path because a small construction crew was working on a bridge that was just barely visible from the trailhead. He was still up for the hike, despite the entire width of the trail being washed out until it was no more than a foot wide with a 6 foot to 12 foot drop into a creek bed with a solid rock and several trees that had fallen down. He is very athletic and I was confident in his abilities if he was. Confident that he could do so, I thought that he could. And he seemed to be very excited to tackle our adventure, so who was I to say no? We made it to a platform that allows you to see the entire cave. There were many downed trees surrounding the platform and it was closed at this point, but we had made it this far so we decided to maneuver around the venue and proceeded the few hundred feet into the cave. We spent most of the time in this area due to the difficulty it was to get there, so I know exactly what it looked like. There were tree roots directly under the platform, and you could climb down either side. It is also worth noting that Hosack's cave is much more like a cliff with an overhanging rock formation and a trickle of a waterfall directly in the middle. It's not a creepy closed up cave. It's very open and beautiful. We got to the cave and I noticed a candle that was not burning recently but had been sitting on a large rock with a heart carved into it. I chalked it up to someone having a date and disregarded it. He wanted to climb to the top where I noticed two more candles and three stacks of small rocks that somebody had stacked up. I felt weird at this point, but it was about this time that he found a small puddle full of baby salamanders and wanted to catch them. This was the happiest I had seen the kid in a long time, and I didn't have the heart to tell him it was time to go. We spent about an hour catching baby salamanders, and I watched him have the time of his life. 
We finally decided to leave and when we got to the platform, dead center in the middle of the tree roots was a wet washcloth hanging that was not there before. He noticed it as well but did not pick up on the severity of the situation that we were apparently in. At that moment, I factually knew two things. One, someone was watching us and we did not see them. And two, they were now potentially hiding in the woods and made it a point not to be seen, but leave an object to be noticed. There was no running back with the narrow trail, and I was not about to tell him that we were in potential danger. I told him to go in front of me and I kept encouraging him that he was doing great over and over, which seemed to speed him up naturally. I never saw anyone while we were on the trail, but I had the most intense feeling of being watched the entire hike back. We got to the car and I locked the doors immediately. On our way out of the park, a filthy man, probably in his 30s, came out of the woods and made it a point to stare at me with the blankest expression I had ever seen on a human being. The man followed me with his eyes and head as I drove by him and continued to stare at him until I couldn't see him anymore. At that point, I knew the third fact. He made it a point to make himself appear to me, and facts one and two were confirmed. That stare stuck with me for days and I considered counseling after this as it bothered me for several weeks causing me severe anxiety. I tried to tell myself that maybe we just interrupted his bath time and he was camping and didn't want to startle us. After all, the crazy looking man had ample time to do anything he wanted while we were catching salamanders. I could not rationalize why he stared into my eyes the way he did. If he wanted to be unnoticed, why would he have made himself so, uh, obvious? Deep down, I know it was much likelier that this was a deliberate action intended to scare me. He never had any idea how panicked I was, and to this day, it is the most fun I had ever seen that kid have. He brings it up regularly, and it's a positive experience for him. But on the other hand, it was one of my worst experiences and made me feel sick and disturbed. Shredded Up Animal by Cal I'm not sure if this would be considered a paranormal story per se, but nothing else really makes sense. Let me try to explain this a bit better. My family goes camping every chance we get. The place we'd always go had no natural predators, at least nothing more significant than a fox. My dad chose this spot so we kids, me and my two siblings, could frolic through the woods without much of a worry. This particular trip was during a long weekend in May. There was still a considerable amount of snow, so my dad brought us ATVs and some sleds. It was the day after we had arrived, and my dad wanted to go on a little trip down the road we came up. I asked to come, and he allowed me to. So we both hopped on his quad and set out on our little trip. I just remembered that we had deer around the area, nothing crazy, but the odd one would wander through our campsite every so often. You could tell they had no natural predators in the area since they didn't run away when there were humans around. My siblings and I would pretty often get close to them, and my parents would always yell at us to stay away because they are rather dangerous. I mean, look up the statistics of how many deer kill people a year, not even including car crashes. It's actually kind of insane. Anyway, my dad and I were a few miles from the campsite when we rounded a corner and came across one of the most gruesome sights I have ever seen. On the side of the road were the pieces of a deer. At least I think it was a deer. There was blood everywhere. Worse still, there was still steam coming from the remains, which meant this was a really recent kill. My dad is usually a pretty calm guy. Not much can rattle him. But I could tell that this freaked him the hell out. He was in the process of turning us around when this... Well, I don't know what this thing was. It was like a screech that came from the forest at first. It was so loud that we both cringed and covered our ears. I remember searching the forest for the source with my eyes, but my dad was in the process of hauling ass down the way we had came. It could have been a trick of the light, or because I was freaked out, or maybe how I saw things, but I could have sworn I saw something running alongside us. But only for just a second or two. I know I sound crazy, but the thing looked like a large dog before it just vanished into the trees. My dad raced back to camp and we were all packed up and headed to a different location by the end of the day. We never did go back to that campsite after this encounter. I did ask my dad about it a couple of years ago and he just said it was because the new camp was better than the old. Better trails and whatnot, he said. But I think he's full of crap. I think whatever we encountered that day scared the hell out of him and I believe that whatever I saw he did too. 
but I, for one, am thankful we never went back. I'm not sure if I could sleep at night after what I saw. It still haunts me to this day in my dreams. I Saw a Ghost in the Woods by Kodak White Last night, my friend and I decided we wanted to go into the woods to get a little scared. So we brought flashlights and a knife and we went down to the creek. We turned the flashlights off to get the best experience and stood there. We overwhelmingly felt like we were being watched, so we left the woods shortly after freaked out. I guess you could say we got exactly what we wanted. Later that night, we were hanging out on a small street near our houses and we wanted to get scared again, so we went to a dark corner of the road where it was just suspicious houses and just the entrance of the woods. We both felt that same feeling from earlier that we were being watched, so we looked down into the woods, and roughly, maybe 50 to 75 yards away, we noticed a specific part was pitch black while you could make out the rest of the woods. The feeling started to get more ominous, and we began to feel surrounded and heard walking in the woods and leaves. We began to hear crunching of twigs and something sounded like it was coming faster towards us. Finally, the silence was too loud and without speaking to each other, we both had an overwhelming feeling of dread and we sprinted back up the street towards our house. But while I was running, I turned to look back and for a split second, I swear I saw a girl in a white gown in the dark spot I had mentioned earlier. She didn't have a body. The only thing I could make out was her upper torso, but it looked like it was a gray aura outlining where a body should be. We ran back to my house and couldn't even describe what we were feeling, but I'm now staying out of the woods for quite some time, especially after dark. Lured into the woods by Swimmy3301. This happened to me only about a few hours ago. I was out walking my dog and we were walking down the street of my neighborhood, which is in a rural area surrounded by woods and forest everywhere. I began to hear what sounded like an owl making their typical noises, so I didn't really pay it much mind. I began walking further with my dog through the area and it sounded like the owl was constantly moving, even though there were no there was no w real way that I wouldn't be able to see it. The trees were pretty thin. You know, obviously it's been cold. All the leaves are down. You can see pretty well into these wooded areas. I followed the sound additionally because I have a personal connection to them. I'm just a big fan of owls and I hope more people are. After many direction changes, I sat down at the forest edge and was standing before the dark entrance. The owl was seemingly gone now, but a creepy crawling sound could be heard, which was faster than it should have been and being directed towards me, it was coming deep from inside the woods. Then I listened to the owl again, hooting from where the strange approaching crawling sounds were coming from. My dog then became terrified and threatened whatever lurked in the darkness. At this point, because the crawling became even faster and incredibly unsettling, I sprinted backward around 30 meters and turned around to see if anything was behind me. Then came that owl sound once more, it was almost like it was beckoning me to return. At this point, I stopped for a second to try and calm my dog down and lead them back home. Suddenly, distorted laughter was all I heard erupting all around us in the forest. This was definitely not that of a human. It almost sounded like I had reverb echoing all around us. After that, I headed straight home, locked all of the doors as it was nighttime here. I know the story was short, I might have some more updates soon as I have to walk my dog often. Thank you for reading this and please share your thoughts in the comments. Hey Swamp, my friends call me Ray, but I'm changing the names of everyone else involved. We lived in Texas until last year when we moved to Alaska. There isn't much I can say about my job without giving away the company, but my time is spent outdoors. Two years ago, my wife, Haley, was involved in an accident and we fell on some hard times. We also have two kids, so it seemed like we were being offered an opportunity to get back on track. I could hardly say no. While we didn't expect to love it out here, we thought it would be bearable long enough to pay off some debt, but no research could have prepared us for this place. 
It took over a year for my wife to physically recover from the car crash. She still has PTSD. Working from home and not traveling on interstates fit into our new lifestyle nicely. Though there are plenty of downsides. The fact that an ocean now separates us from the rest of our family bothers me the most. The kids didn't want to leave their friends, but luckily, they haven't hit their teen years yet, or the resistance would have been much worse. Jason is only 10, and Jenny is 7. Surprisingly, they've adjusted better than we could have ever dreamed. The strange day and night cycles aren't split into six-month cycles as we had always heard. There are a couple of occasions where it's one or the other, but it's mostly just long summer days and winter nights. The kids were happy to discover what a novelty it all was to everyone back home. During the first two weeks, they practically lived on FaceTime. It made us feel like everything would be okay, which was a big deal considering how poorly Haley and I were coping. The overall stress was unbelievable. Moving to a new city is a significant undertaking, but this was a different league entirely. We failed to appreciate that Alaska is very cold. Obviously, we knew it was something to prepare for in terms of buying the necessary supplies, but those who have never experienced a proper winter can't grasp how drastically it changes your daily life. We couldn't afford four entirely new wardrobes on top of new tires and the countless other items we didn't consider. Thankfully, our families were able to help. I don't know what we would have done without them, to be honest. Our house is far more excellent than we had in Texas which was another plus for the kids, if not slightly ironic. Usually it's more expensive to live in the city than in the country, but that's not true here. Thanks to my company, we got a great deal on our house, but everything else is nearly double the price. We came very close to selling our cars, rather than have to pay for them to be brought over, but thank goodness we didn't. Had we understood my drastically higher salary was to cover basic living expenses, I'm not sure we would have moved and our only neighbor, Odette, lives across the road. She and her husband bought their home over 40 years ago, but sadly he passed away last spring. She doesn't get out often, but she's very kind. The day we moved in, she came over with a delicious casserole. There's nothing like a free meal after a long, hard day. Especially that day involved your first glimpse at the grocery store's outrageous pricing. Odette accepted our invitation to stay for dinner. She may be in her late 60s, but she can keep up with the best of us. She has a thousand stories. The kids would have listened all night if we let them. Once they were finally in bed, the rest of us had our coffee in the den. That's when Odette's stories started to get a little weird. The lighthearted tone in her voice suddenly turned very grave, and her gaze dropped to the floor. When you bought this house... Did Alan tell you about any of the local legends we have around here? Her words ran together as she blurted them out. Um, nope, none that I can remember. I was confident because there had been almost no contact with the actual owner. I looked to Haley for confirmation, and she was also shaking her head. The drastic change in our neighbor's demeanor made us feel like she was about to deliver some terrible news. Like something along the lines of the previous owner slaughtered his whole family or was some sort of serial killer or something like that. Something dangerous. I had a feeling. She sipped her coffee and took a deep breath before continuing. Did you know Alaska has its very own Bermuda Triangle? We had certainly not heard about this, but she told us all about it. Something like five out of every thousand people go missing around here, and most happen in the area we are in. I was surprised, but not necessarily frightened. Many states are uninhabited. It wasn't a stretch to assume people might go out, lose their way, and succumb to the wildlife, or the elements. It was like Odette could hear the thought forming. That's when she explained the Kustaka legends. Kustaka are ottermen. I remember hearing a few Bigfoot stories in the past, but nothing we dreamed that could be real. Even as we listened to her describe the eight-foot-tall shape-shifting creature, I couldn't create a severe mental image of a giant, man-like otter walking around on two legs, at least not maliciously. Our neighbor described how they would sometimes take the appearance of a loved one to lure their victims into the woods. There's no shortage of people willing to give first-hand accounts of their own experiences, though witness testimony doesn't mean much to me personally. It seemed like the Kustaka were Alaska's version of cow tipping. Just because something is impossible doesn't stop everyone and their brother from saying it happened. 
Even though these creatures usually lure victims to their doom, Odette claimed they sometimes appear in human form to approach those who are lost or injured. They pretend to offer the victim aid, but they intend to lead them deeper into the forest, where they will turn the human into one of their own. I'm still unclear about what the process entails, but I didn't try to learn. Even now, it's difficult for me to wrap my head around this. When I asked Odette why she was telling us these things, she said it was because of her son Cam, who hired a Kentucky boy to work on his crew several years ago. They warned Kyle of the various dangers from day one, but he thought they were hazing the newbie. When his aggravation began affecting his job, performance, Odette invited the whole crew to a barbecue in hopes that the boy would take her words more seriously. Unfortunately, he chose not to attend. Then, at roughly 3 p.m. the following Tuesday, Kyle signaled a bathroom break to his supervisor and stepped away. He was never seen again. No one expected him to vanish in the middle of a shift, but concerns proliferated when 20 minutes passed without his return. Initially, they hoped he was only trying to scare them for revenge. Cam and three others searched for him while the rest continued working. Formal searches were conducted over the following weeks, but there was no trace. There's nothing Odette could have done, but she feels deep remorse for his loss. Our hearts ached for the poor woman. Haley and I found ourselves believing in the Kustaka to ease her mind, but we began discussing it after she left. As someone who wasn't raised with Otterman lore, it was tough to take seriously. So what did we do? We turned to YouTube and discovered Alaska is known for many creepy cryptids, and Kustaka stories are among them. The History Channel has a great show called Missing in Alaska, and episode 10 has what we were looking for. It told of a writer who came down to research the legend for a book, but he vanished too. That's insane, I won't go through the whole video, but while it was enjoyable, it didn't convince us otter men existed. We believed that the locals truly believed in them, which was good enough. We decided to humor the legend as a show of respect. Honestly, it encouraged safer practices in the wilderness which can only be a good thing. Overall, our strategy worked well, though I was admittedly nervous starting the new job when I learned some of our work would take us through the triangle. My co-workers' stories didn't help either, but things got more accessible after the first month passed without incident. The days began to bleed together as life moved on in a beautifully mundane blur, and eventually I forgot about the legends completely until late February. The job should have been simple, Find the spot on the land, dig, and get home before something gets frostbite. It was the same routine like any other day except for Jason's birthday. He was disappointed I had to work and didn't want to open his presents without me. We FaceTimed long enough for him to rip open some paper, but the signal dropped. Luckily, Haley had the foresight to give him the iPad first, and I felt less guilty about his decision to wait for the rest. I worked like a machine. I didn't even stop for lunch. My mind was focused on getting the job done and making it home. That evening, in the gray light of dusk, we packed up and made the short hike back to our trucks. It had been a long day, and no one lingered around to chat, and I didn't blame them. I was five to ten minutes down the road when I realized my phone was still at the site. When talking to Jason, I had propped it up on a tree and forgot to grab it when my hands were free again. If it had been anything else, I would have left it for the next day, but not my phone. No thoughts of danger entered my mind, but why would it? I was returning to a place I knew well, and it would only take a moment to walk in, get my phone, and get back on the road. I drove as close to the site as safely as possible and found myself running the rest of the way. I still don't understand why I felt so rushed. There was no doubt Jason had been thoroughly engrossed in his new tablet all day. His other presents weren't going anywhere. Yet I was running through the wilderness like a fool. It was almost completely dark when I reached for my phone. I hadn't thought to grab a light, so I'm not sure what I would have done if it had gotten dark first. As I stood trying to turn on the phone's flashlight, I heard what sounded like a fox crying out. A friend had recently found one trapped in an old hunter's snare, and I wouldn't say that I liked the thought of leaving it if the same thing happened again. I rushed off with my light pointed at the ground ahead. I was nervous about leaving the trail, but the cry sounded very close. I continued straight for a few yards, maybe 20 or so, without seeing any sign of the fox. No matter how far I walked, it seemed like it would be past the next shrub. I must have walked 50 to 60 yards when the noise was immediately cut off. 
like someone pressed stop on a tape recorder, and it suddenly began to snow heavily. The weather here is unpredictable, but that instance was strange even by Alaskan standards. The howling wind was the only sound in the forest and I had to move quickly. It doesn't take long for flurries to become full-on snowstorms here and I didn't want to think about what would happen. As the snowfall increased, I turned back the way I came and the light began reflecting into my eyes. The temperature dropped rapidly and my truck was the only shelter for miles. I opened the phone's compass to ensure I maintained a straight line, but no matter which direction I pointed, it wouldn't spin. Hoping to use the GPS, I hunched down against a tree and turned off the light while trying to open Google Maps, but there was no signal, not even to send a text. To make matters even worse, I only had 48% battery remaining, and solid, white snow walls were now surrounding me. It's a miracle I didn't lay down to die on that spot. If I weren't a father, things would have gone differently. I don't know. Forcing myself to leave the tree's illusion of safety was extremely difficult. I was practically crawling when I continued from my desperate search for the path. The wind tore into me from the right. My beanie doubled as my face mask, and thankfully, I developed a habit of putting my gloves in a coat pocket, or they'd be in the truck with my boots and earmuffs. The body loses the most heat through its ears and feet. The added layer of my coat's thick hood helped protect my head, but I feared the worst for my numb toes. No expense is spared regarding the boots we wear out here. They are knee-high, insulated, and clunky. Perfect for the job, but awful for the roads. Like most of the guys, I changed into something lighter at the end of the day, and that's why I was wearing a pair of regular Red Wings. Even though my feet were too cold to feel, I knew each step forward was filling my boots with more snow as their rims dipped beneath the surface. If nothing else, the sheer weight increase was enough to be sure. My mind was overrun with daydreams of life on disability after losing my feet. I would become an alcoholic, Haley would leave me, the kids would hate me, and I would move in with my parents. It was as clear as the air was white as I realized my hands were also going numb from clawing myself forward against the worst gusts of wind. I would have cried, but I'm sure my tear ducts were frozen shut. My snowballs were lodged somewhere between my lungs, but I'm trying to keep this PG, if you will. I was on the verge of digging a hole behind the next tree I stumbled into when I froze in place at the sound of a familiar voice calling my name. It was faint over the storm. I thought I imagined it at first, but then I heard it again, slightly louder. It, it was my boss, Brian. I screamed so loud that my raw throat felt like it was cracking open, but I wasn't going to waste my chance at survival. My heart swelled with overwhelming relief when he answered my cries and I pulled myself upright while impatiently waiting for rescue. The wind calmed slightly, allowing for me to hear his footsteps. The sound was beautiful and terrifying. He was approaching from my left, meaning I had to be going the wrong way. My sense of relief was tainted with horror as my brain entered several what-ifs in the next short seconds it took for Brian to come into view. A fierce gust of wind stopped him roughly 30 feet away and he shouted, Follow me! before turning to lead us back. The thought of reaching my truck, mostly the heater, pushed me away from the flood of worst-case scenarios. There would be plenty of nightmares and therapy bills for those later. Staying low, I hurried forward to close the gap between myself and Brian, but he was also picking up speed. That was fine with me, the faster we got out, the better, but I was so focused on trying to catch up that I failed to notice we still hadn't reached the path. Even worse, I was moving at a dangerous speed with only a dim light pointed ahead of my feet. Any misstep could have easily twisted or broken my ankle. Eventually common sense took over, my mindless panic. Brian, wait! I shouted as loudly as my raw throat would allow, but he didn't seem to hear me. I tried again and again as we continued to speed through denser foliage. My feet were getting tangled in vines, thorny branches were tearing my coat, and I knew something was wrong. I should have known much sooner. Finally, I stopped dead in my tracks, turned around and resumed moving as fast as I dared, fully aware I would not survive a fall. My encounter with... The figure, I called Brian, played through my mind in a split-screen fashion alongside Odette's warnings of Kustaka, taking on the appearance of friends to lure victims more plunging into the forest. 
The only thing capable of pulling me from those thoughts was the horrifying sound of Brian's voice calling out, What are you doing? That's the wrong way. I know it's always a mistake to look back, but that's precisely what I did. At first glance, I saw an enormous black shape dart past a tree and vanish from sight. My heart skipped at least three beats before I could force myself to move again. The shape I saw was a minimum of eight feet high, and there was a dark undertone in the voice that yelled, Come back! We're trying to help you! It sounded so close when it spoke that I stumbled and couldn't help casting a glance to my right. I didn't think it was possible to feel even more frightened than I was, but the image of a giant, hairy, disfigured face seared into my mind as I struggled to regain footing. It was poking its enormous head from behind a tree. I could still see it now, clear as day, burned into my mind, and there is little hope to ever forget that thing in the future. I'm not sure how long I ran, but it felt like an eternity. All I can say for sure is that I kept putting one foot in front of the other and eventually I had several voices calling my name from multiple directions in the distance. To say I was skeptical would be a vast understatement, but I didn't know what to do. Every move felt fatal. What if they are all Kustaka, or one of the several other cryptids I've heard about? What if they're real people, but I ran away? What if the first monster catches up while I'm standing here? Hoping it was a reasonable thing to assume monsters wouldn't have flashlights, I decided to shout a tentative cry for help and run towards the first light I saw. Unfortunately, that cry turned into the high-pitched squeal of a teenage girl when a branch snapped directly behind me. In complete darkness, I surged forward, unsure if the snag at the bottom of my coat was real or imagined, and a dozen shots rang out in reply. In seconds, spotlights were pointed in my direction and the sound of weapons being prepared to fire was sweet music to my ears. I screamed, It's behind me! several times before collapsing, but I didn't need to say more. Everyone understood my meaning perfectly. I was later told that Kustaka probably left when it heard all the other people. As I thought, Haley called Brian when I didn't come home, and he took care of the rest. They all raced back to search for me. Apparently there's no point in wasting time with police in those weather conditions, and I'm grateful they didn't. There's no doubt I was close to the end. After I collapsed, they zipped me into a sleeping bag Tommy had the foresight to bring from his truck and carried me out of there like in a body bag. I wasn't too far off in the direction I was traveling, but I wouldn't have found the trail. Even without the possible Kustaka encounter or psychotic break, whichever you believe, there's no doubt that I would have died out there if they hadn't found me. I had to spend a little time in the hospital because of the frostbite. It's a complicated healing process, but miraculously, I've gotten to keep all of my fingers and toes. I'm primarily okay now, but my sense of touch isn't quite what it used to be in the worst places. No circumstance will ever get me to step foot into the wilderness alone again. In our original budget, we planned to live here for four to five years, which increased with the unexpected living cost. I'm not so sure if I can last that long though. Haley and I have decided to call our families tomorrow to discuss possible options. If we could find jobs beforehand and arrange a place to stay while we look for a new house, it may be possible to leave sooner. We don't plan to tell them about the triangle. They would be deeply concerned for our mental health. We're heartbroken, and I regularly work near dangerous wildlife. Those are facts. I'm sure there are more, but those are enough. I'm ashamed of how stupid it was to put myself in that situation which must have been evident to the others. I can guarantee every person in our tiny town heard what happened that day, but no one has questioned me about it. I don't think I could say all of this if they did, not face to face, and I'm sure they know that too. But writing it out like this, I don't know. I do feel a little better. Well, that's all I have to say besides thanks for doing what you do. Even if you don't use this for your channel, I appreciate that you took the time to read it. If I weren't trying to move away from this frozen wasteland, I would be supporting you with more than likes and shares. Keep up the great work, and best wishes to you and your family, Swamp Dweller. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true deep woods and outdoors horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it, and that helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. If you haven't joined us yet, what are you waiting for? Be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new episode. 
I upload them nearly every single day in all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to feature in a future episode, be sure to submit yours at swampdweller.net or at r slash thedarkswamp on reddit. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please be sure to give this a 5 star rating over there as it helps us a ton and is very, very appreciated. I'd love to know in the comments down below what story was your favorite tonight. It helps me pick out better stories. If you made it all the way to the end, be sure to comment the code word Leaping Ohio to confuse anybody in the comments who didn't make it to the end. I love seeing how nutty your comments can get. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting the swamp. Don't forget to join me over on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all those good socials. And I'll see you soon with another creepy episode.